You can have a seat, Cove Church. You know, if you wonder why we sing songs at the top of service, it's for that experience. I think sometimes we think church is just about coming and getting something, and it is. We receive, but it's also about giving worship to our Father. That's what we take that time. So sometimes it's like, hey, hey I'll just, you know, kind of slide in because the song's happening. I'll just slide in for later. But no, this is a really important part of what we do. So thank you for experiencing that with us together. Before we get to the message, um, there's a couple of really great things we get to do. One is I, I want to make mention, this is the week we launch our Future and Hope offering for this year. That's an extra offering that we invite you to participate in uh, once a year. And it goes to the needs of this facility. This, this year we are addressing safety needs in our facility. That includes lighting in here in the sanctuary. It includes a new area of check-in for our little kids, uh, an improved reception area so we can have a safer space for volunteers to uh, be a part of reception. So that's what we're doing this year. It's all part of loving our community by having them have a safe place to come and to worship Jesus. So we invite you to be praying about that. This is really when we kick it off. This is when that, if we were to, to pass an offering plate, it would be this week that we would do that. But since we don't do that, we're inviting you to, to put that at the forefront of your life and ask Jesus, how do you want me to be a part of that? And then do that. You can do so by giving uh, in our giving kiosk or online. Just identify it as future and hope. All right. Speaking of giving and sending and loving our neighbors... We have an incredible example of that today that we get to send another crew out. I want to invite the Morris family up as well as Julie Philippi, wherever they are. Where are you? Lo there they are, over here. Messed me up, I mean to the left. Give them a hand as they come. Come on up into the light. Don't step back into the darkness. If you don't know who this is, Eric and Andrea Morris, this is Hadley. They also have Brady, who's their son, who's a little bit older than Hadley. And this is Julie Philippi, who, although doesn't share the bloodline of this family, is in every way a part of this family. And the reason we're bringing them to you, and, and many of you know this, we've been talking about this for a while, is today is the day we get to send them uh, as missionaries to Fresno, California. Uh, so Eric and Andrea have worked in the marriage ministry here in our church for many, many years. We've been able to watch this develop and grow. And then Julie has been part of the worship ministry for all that time. Hadley is just a light everywhere she goes. Uh, Andrea is also a, a highly skilled nurse. Eric has been our facilities coordinator. Uh, and it's a part-time job, but he does it with a full-time heart, which is so amazing. And so... In doing so, in sending them today, we realize there is, there is joy in the sending, but there's also a void for us. Because it's like, oh, we got to say goodbye. Yeah. <laughs> I clap to hide the tears. That's why I do that. <laughs> push it down, push it down. Um, we, are, we want to send them... I, I don't see a microphone in your hand, so I think we're going to go without that. Okay. Uh, it was an option for you to say something if you wanted to, but I see we're all crying, so we're not going to do that. Um, they're, they're going to be missionaries. This whole unit is going down. They've, they've uh, rented a house. They've sold their house here. They've sold everything and are up and moving to Fresno, California, to a part of Fresno that is very, very underserved, really highly impoverished area of Fresno, and they are reaching out and going to bring health and the light of Jesus to that place. It is an amazing calling that Jesus has, has given them, and it's one that we support them as a church, our 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 um, regular giving part of that money goes, goes towards them. There's individuals in our church that, that's supporting them. And maybe some of you will continue to join the team, which is what we would hope. Um, today, in fact, if you want to hear more about this, after second service, so you'd have to come back, unless you want to just do another service, which you can. Um, after second service, in the gym, there's a reception for them. Uh, you can go and, and love them and hug on them and say goodbye and find out more about what they're doing. Hopefully, join their team. And it doesn't start till 1 o'clock. Thanks, Julie. Not till 1, so don't come early. We'll, kick, we'll just send you away. It'll be bad. Yeah. Oh, you can help set up. That'll be good. Okay. Um, so with that, let's pray over these folks. I want you to reach a hand, and I'm thinking of this passage right now. Matthew 28, and in fact, I'll read this to you. 
Matthew 28, verse 18, then Jesus came to them and said, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. And surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. The thing we want you to remember as you go is you do not go alone. You go with our hearts, and you go with the authority and the presence of Christ in your life. And that is enough. So on that, let's reach a hand this way and pray for these folks. Jesus, I am constantly amazed at your ability to call us, to lift us up, and to send us out. And Lord, these are dear, dear friends. And so as a church, we today send our very best. And I pray that Fresno would be a place of amazing open arms to their love. That you would go before them, Lord, and pave the way. That you would order every step. That you would provide for every need financially, emotionally, spiritually, in every way. That we don't expect this to be an easy road, but we do expect it fully to be good because of your calling in their lives. We pray safety, protection, and joy. We send them in our love, but more importantly, we send them in your love. And in Jesus' mighty name, and everybody said, amen. amen. Give them a big hand. I love you. I love you. Love you, Hannah. Love you, Jules. <sighs> You know, um, the examples today, from the Mexico mission team to gifts given towards Future and Hope, and finally sending out the Morrises to Fresno, California, it all points to this truth. God's church is at its best when it is thinking about the needs of others over the needs of itself. God's church is at its best when it's thinking about the needs of others over the needs of itself. That's what we're seeing today. We, we are sending out today some of my favorite people, which means that the sending is not easy. And yet that story is told over and over throughout church history. In the New Testament, you see these moments where with tears in their eyes, God's people hear the call of God's Holy Spirit and they are sent to reach other communities. You read in the New Testament these tearful goodbyes. Why? Because God's church is at its best when it's thinking about the needs of others over the needs of itself. That amidst the concerns and the fears and the hurts that plague our world, we choose to be a people who will meet others in the midst of all that, in broken places, in messy places. And we know that to be true because that's exactly where Jesus meets us. But sadly, often I think our stance, uh, or the church culture stance, has been to get really good at setting certain expectations for our neighbors while being less effective at building relationship with our neighbors. Here's an example, one of my favorite stories. Uh, the story of a DEA officer in Texas. And he goes up to this ranch, and there's a rancher there working on the fence. And he says, hi there, I'm, I'm with the DEA. I'm here to inspect your property for illegal drugs, you know, that you might be producing here. And the rancher's like, well, okay, you know, go ahead. But I'd stay away from the south field over there if I were you. And at that, the DEA officer just exploded. Mister, I have the authority of the federal government with me. Do you see this badge? This badge means I can go anywhere, anytime I want, no questions asked. Do you understand that? And he said, okay, sorry, didn't know, yep, yeah, do your thing. Went back to his work. A few moments later, the rancher heard loud screams coming from the south field. The DEA officer is running for his life. He's being chased by the rancher's giant Santa Gertrudis bull. And every step, the bull was gaining ground on him. He would certainly be gored before he reached the fence. And the man was terrified. 
So the rancher threw down his tools, went over to the fence, and yelled at the top of his lungs, your badge, show him your badge. <laughs> Often, Christians have come into town with a badge, but Jesus asks us to come with a bandage. That's what we see in those we're sending out today. That we refuse to posture ourselves as us and them. We recognize it's simply just us, humanity. And this must permeate our thinking, because if it doesn't, our tendency well, to become more disconnected from our communities, more aloof to their real needs, more tone deaf to what's really going on in our world. So what does it look like to change that? In short, it looks like loving our neighbor. Loving our neighbor. And this is the role we look at today as we continue our role model series. In fact, we, as we've done for the past few weeks, we're going to begin with our series scripture. Let's read this together. Big voices, Go! Therefore, imitate God like dearly loved children. Live your life with love, following the example of Christ, who loved us and gave himself for us. If we are to imitate Christ, we will learn what it is to live incarnationally, meaning that we're bringing the love of Jesus to our neighbors, to everyone we encounter, which means, yes, we see Jesus working in our lives when we're at church, but we also see that in our homes, and we see it at work, and we see it at school, and we see it at our gym, and in our hobbies, and in our commutes, everywhere. It's an assignment that continues throughout our lives. It's a role given to every person that we're called to be a good neighbor. And Jesus tells a really well-known parable to illustrate the importance of that task and that role. Now remember, a parable is an ideal story. It, Jesus was not necessarily retelling a story for accuracy. He was creating a story from scratch to illustrate a truth. So every part of that story is there for a reason. So we're going to look at Luke chapter 10. It's the story of the Good Samaritan. And the first truth that must be present if we are to be a good neighbor is this. Good neighbors offer a limitless love. A limitless love. Let's read it together. Starting in Luke chapter 10, verse 25. Big voices, go. And behold, a lawyer stood up to put him to the test, saying, Teacher, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? He said to him, What is written in the law? How do you read it? And he answered, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your strength and with all your mind and your neighbor as yourself. And he said to him, You've answered correctly. Do this and you will live. But he, desiring to justify himself, said to Jesus, And who is my neighbor? All right. <laughs> your neighbor is Jim. Yes. <laughs> So Jesus was approached by this lawyer, and this expert in the law decides to test Jesus, right? Now, that's never a good idea, testing Jesus, but he does it. And so he asks the question, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? Now, that's the big question, right? That's a going for the juggler type of question. And as is so often the case, Jesus answers that question with another question. He's like, hey, you're a lawyer. How do you read it? Okay. And he says, basically, well, you love God and love your neighbor. And Jesus said, that's great. Just do that, and you're good, okay? And then the lawyer reaches into his bag of lawyer tricks, and he goes, ah, yes, we agree. But pray tell, who then is my neighbor? And Jesus, as he's often inclined to do, answers that question with a story. But before we get there, I want you to see something. It speaks of the lawyer Desiring to justify himself, asking, who is my neighbor? That's a very revealing question. At its best, it's a theological inquiry, who am I to love or not love? But at worst, and perhaps more likely, it is an effort for the lawyer to remove himself from God's mandate to love his neighbor. To find a loophole, as lawyers like to do. To find a crack in the law. 
a way to get around the difficult and messy work of loving difficult and messy people. A way to keep his religion in a safe little club, surrounded by people who look like him and think like him and share his point of view to stay comfortable. And too often, I think, we're tempted to live like that lawyer. Now, that was the lawyer's first mistake, to think that somehow walking with a perfect God would absolve us from having to walk with imperfect people because just the opposite is true. The opposite is true. I think of this. Um, I've told this story before, but it, it applies to this so well. When we were planting Redmond, I encountered a guy named Rob, and we started to become friends. He was just coming to faith. He and his wife were just coming to faith. And at some point, he said, hey, we should hang out. Let's go have lunch. I said, great. I like lunch. Let's do that. He said, why don't you meet me at work? I'll give you a tour of work, and then we'll go to lunch. I said, great. Where do you work? He said, I work at the sewage plant. Cool. Little sewage, the lunch. Great. Let's do that. So I met him at the sewage plant, Redmond Sewage Plant there, and he, he gave me a tour of the sewage plant, which I thought was hilarious. I had this whole shelf dedicated to action figures who had made the journey through, and they were up there on this shelf. They didn't look happy anymore, but they were up there. <laughs> and there was <laughs> all these vats uh, of, of liquids and things. Some of them looked like water you can drink. Some of them was like, oh, that guy needs to go to the doctor. It was that kind of thing that I watched. And I walked clear through the sewage plant, okay? And I realized at that point, and then we went to lunch, which is really a, a weird shift. But at that point, I realized to walk with Rob meant to walk amongst the sewage. That, that was where he lived and worked. We forget that to walk with God means to walk where God walks, which means we will walk among the mess. That's what Jesus does. That's what God does. That means we will do the same. The assumption of the lawyer was flawed, okay? He was thinking there must be some that God's love doesn't apply to. I don't have to worry about giving love to. There some that God's love doesn't reach, some that God's love is not available to. So he asked Jesus, define neighbor. Would you narrow the field? Because God certainly can't mean that we're to love everybody. Hmm. And yet the Gospel of John tells us God does exactly that, that God so loved, what, the world? Not God so loved only Christians, or God so loved only Jews, or God so loved only this political party, or on, only that nation. This tells us that God loved all. Muslims, yes. Buddhists, yes. Criminals, yes. Atheists, yes. Your annoying cousin, yes. All. God so loves the world which means God's love includes all and excludes none. Now, this doesn't guarantee that people love God in return. That's different. But it does guarantee God's love for people. I love how Paul expresses this in the book of Romans. For I am convinced that neither death nor life, neither angels nor demons, neither the present nor the future, nor any powers, neither height nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. There is the truth. But like this lawyer, we can find ourselves asking the question, God, you don't expect me to love them, do you? You don't expect me to love them. They annoy me, or they hurt me, or they attack me, or they disappointed me, or they frustrate me, or they offend me, or they are politically different than me, and they are my enemy. And Jesus says, exactly. Matthew 5, anyone can love their friends, but it takes my love to love your enemy. That's why this conversation has to happen before anything else when it comes to the role of a good neighbor, here it is. Until I understand that God loves everyone, I will continue to look for reasons why I don't have to. But, if I realize that God's love is limitless, then it's possible for my love to be limitless as well. Because good neighbors offer a limitless love. That's the first thing. Here's the second. Good neighbors offer a sacrificial love compassion. Let's continue 
the passage, big voices, go. Jesus replied, a man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho, and he fell among robbers who stripped him and beat him and departed, leaving him half dead. Now by chance a priest was going down that road, and when he saw him, he passed by on the other side. So likewise a Levite, when he came to the place and saw him, passed by on the other side. Let me give you a little bit of context here. The Jericho-Jerusalem road was 15 miles of very rough, very remote, notoriously dangerous, hilly, and cave-ridden terrain. It made it very easy for thieves and robbers to operate there. They could hide out and attack people and, and disappear. And so this picture to the audience of Christ made perfect sense. They're like, that's a bad road. If you're going to get mugged, it's going to be on the Jerusalem-Jericho road. This made total sense to them. For us, it's like if you go to downtown Eugene, there's a good chance it's going to be weird. You just know that. We just connect with that. It's going to be weird. They knew you go on the Jerusalem-Jericho road, it's go you're going to get mugged. They just knew that. Okay. The robbers came. They beat him in the story. They took his clothes. They left him for dead. Very, very sad. Okay. But there's good news, right? Because here comes a priest. Oh, that's going to be great, right? I mean, again, this made sense. Many priests lived in Jericho, and they would be going to Jerusalem to fulfill their yearly priestly churchy duties. So they would have to take this trip. And so, of course, this priest, this must be the hero of the story, right? I mean, we, we know that he's got to be the hero. He's, he's going to stop, and he's going to put this man on his donkey, and he's going to take care for him because he has resources, because he's the good guy. But the problem is, as a religious leader, he had some religious rules. And in Judaism, a priest, if they got within six feet of a dead person, they became ceremonially unclean. And that guy looked dead. And he might be dead. And so if he was to stop, he can't do his priestly duties. He's going to have to take an extra week of time and money to then get ceremonially clean. Now, he could do that, but it would slow him down. And it would cost him time and treasure. The priest would have had to literally put the needs of that person above his own needs. What a concept to sacrifice his righteous religion for a merciful act. That's the question that this circumstance asked of that priest. So, how's he going to answer? What will he do? He can't just leave the guy to die, right? Nope, he can. And he does. Just leaves him to die. And religion wins. Same thing happens with another religious guy, this Levite, walks right on by. Here's the thing. Sadly, as we know, in the battle between religious righteousness and merciful action, we see religion win quite a bit. Let me tell you a secret that pastors don't like to talk about. Sometimes the church thing can get in the way of the God thing. Right? Right? Sometimes the church thing can actually get in the way of the God thing. I love church. I love God's church. I've planted two churches. I love this church so much. But sometimes the church thing can get in the way of the God thing. What church should do is inspire us to the actions of Christ, not replace them. That's incarnation. That's what it means to live out my relationship with Jesus in the world. My church should invite me to allow God to change me so that I can then more effectively change my community. That I can see, see God as he wants us to find our place of ministry within the church. Yes, God absolutely wants us to find our place of ministry within the church, and there's so many opportunities for that. But God also passionately desires that all of us would make a difference in the community at large. In Eugene and Lane County, and Fresno, and Tijuana. That's incarnation. And that requires a shift in priority. For this priest and Levite, church was important, and that's not all bad. But if the choice has to be made 
between doing my normal church thing and showing love to someone outside the church, we see here the choice was clear. Love the outsider first. Put their needs above my own. Think others first, not me first. To actually see people and care, even and especially the messy ones. Because that's what Christ asks of all of us. That we will always choose mercy over sacrifice, as the scripture compels us to do. Because good neighbors offer a sacrificial compassion. That's the second thing. Here's the last thing. Good neighbors offer an innovative solution. Innovative solution. Let's read this together. Big voices, go. But a Samaritan, as he journeyed, came to where he was. And when he saw him, he had compassion. He went to him and bound up his wounds, pouring on oil and wine. Then he set him on his own animal and brought him to an inn and took care of him. And the next day he took out two denarii and gave them to the innkeeper, saying, Take care of him, and whatever more you spend, I will repay you when I come back. Which of these three do you think proved to be a neighbor to the man who fell among the robbers? All right. Again, parables are ideal stories. Every detail matters. So, who does Jesus make the hero of this story? Who does Jesus make the good guy, the knight in shining armor? Ba 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 ba. It's the Samaritan. Wait, Samaritans were despised. Doesn't make sense. In the first century, as far as the Jews were concerned, there was no such thing as a good Samaritan. They had high levels of prejudice against them. They were known to them as the stupid people. That's how they saw them. And this Samaritan did what the so-called smart folks wouldn't do. He really saw the hurting man, and he took action like God does. Had compassion on that man like God does. He did what God would want us to do. He bound up his wounds, perhaps even with his own garment, bound up his wounds. Poured on oil and wine, which was the most advanced form of first aid at that time. And he takes him to the inn. Now that in itself is courageous for this reason. When a Samaritan rode into town with an incapacitated and beat up man on his donkey, they weren't thinking, oh, what a nice Samaritan. They were thinking, that Samaritan did it. That's what they were thinking. The only parallel I could come to is like a Native American in the 1800s in Dodge City rides into town with a cowboy over the back of his Appaloosa, and the cowboy has two arrows in his back. And the locals are not thinking, wow, what a nice guy. They're thinking, that guy did it. Okay, that's the parallel. So at personal risk, the Samaritan takes him to the inn. At personal cost, he pays the equivalent of $132 to the innkeeper. And with personal responsibility, he vows to return and take care of any additional needs. So what does it take to love my neighbor? Here it is. Loving my neighbor requires personal risk, personal cost, and personal responsibility. That's what it means. It's what you see being lived out in the ministries that we've highlighted today. People who have said, if not now, when? And if not us, who? And for many of them, this is stuff they have never done before. <laughs> That's the innovation. That's the innovative solution. That until we do this thing, until we do something we've never done before, we can't reach who we've never reached. So we say yes to things that seem a bit crazy, a bit unorthodox, taking personal risk and cost and responsibility. That's where the calling of Christ always leads us. This is how the light of Christ expands into the darkness. And this is true for every Christ follower, and here's why it's true. I can love my neighbor, but I can't love yours. I can love my neighbor, but I can't love yours. Meaning, I can love the person that God has put on my path, but I don't have access to the person who's on your path. You do. You have to love them. 
They're on your road. And God wants to show you how to love them just as God wants to show me how to love those that are on my road. We all get to take personal responsibility. And yes, there is risk in this, and there is cost in this, but it is ours to trust God in this because that person is on our road. We were, um, the car show in Junction City was this last weekend, the function for Junction, and where we live, it's like, basically in the car show, pretty much. I mean, like, people, we didn't have to move. We just sat on our porch, and cars would drive by. And But people would also walk to get to the, the main street because we're a block away from it. And so um, my daughter-in-law, Riley, decided she would make a hopscotch thing for our grandson, Bo, on our sidewalk in front of our house. And it started just regular hopscotch, but she's very creative. So she just made it, like, a 50-foot-long, like, thing you had to do. Like, you'd step on this and put your hand there and put your hand in this flower. It was this whole, the most, uh, most amazing hopscotch you ever saw. And she put it together, and she had Bo go through it, you know, and that was really fun. And it was fun to watch him do it. But what was great was after that, other people walking to the parade... <laughs> We're like, oh, hopscotch, let's do it. And we're watching them do the same thing. They're jumping and hopping and putting their hands down. Like, that's so cool. And we watched, and it was so fun for us because they experienced a bit of joy on our section of road. The question is, what will people experience on your section of road? When they encounter your life. Jesus wants to show us how to love the people on a road, and it's likely going to be in ways we haven't done before, in ways that might come as a surprise to us. These are God's innovative solutions, and it happens when we do what we've never done, the things that are scary enough that we know, I can't do this without God. That's where God wants us, and that's what we're called to, because good neighbors offer an innovative solution. I'll wrap up with this. Jesus wraps up this story with this great little bow. It's Luke 10, 36 and 37. He says, ask this question, which of those three do you think proved to be the neighbor to the man who fell among the robbers? And he said, the one who showed him mercy. And Jesus said to him, go and do likewise. It's a challenge to the lawyer. It's a challenge to us. And if I could encourage you in this, Keep allowing your relationship with Jesus to be lived out and made real in your world, on your road. That's what good neighbors do. This is living the incarnation. It includes offering a limitless love, a sacrificial compassion, and an innovative solution. Jesus wants to lead you to do what you've never done and to go where you've never gone to reach those you've never reached. That's how we walk redemptively in the role of neighbor. And if we do so, our world will see Jesus walking among them because Jesus is being revealed through you. With that, let's pray together. <clears throat> I think the Holy Spirit wants to speak to us today in this way. For those in this place who would say, you know, it scares me a little, Jesus, or maybe even scares me a lot, but I really do want to love those who are on my road and maybe do so in ways that I haven't before. I do want to step out into some things you're calling me to that are new for me and, and scary for me, and yet I know you're in that. I want to step into this role of ministry. I want to step into this position in, at work. I want to step into this volunteer place in my community. I want, I want to do that in response to what you're saying, Jesus, but I need your help. I need your grace. I need your direction. And so if that's where you find yourself today, you're willing to say, you know what, I, I want to be that person who is a good neighbor, and I want Jesus to challenge me in being a better neighbor. If that's you in this place, I just invite you to raise your hand and say, yeah, that's me, that's me. Yeah, hands all over this place. Jesus, this is such a um, powerful parable to us, and so I pray today that by your grace, we could learn what it is to walk and live as good neighbors, that we could see people as you see them and respond to them as you respond to them, and, and we could be a people who 
bring you to our world, that we would see those that are on our road that you've called us to minister to and, and to bring your love to and your light to. Help us to do that, Lord, because we can't do this on our own strength. This requires you. We're totally desperate for you in this. And it scares us, Lord, but it's, that's a good place to be because we know that you're the one that does it. You're the one that makes this happen. So help us to take our steps of faith. As we've seen many taking steps of faith today, we want to take the steps of faith you're calling us to, the steps of response to you that ultimately help us to be good neighbors. We love you. It's in Jesus' name. And everybody said, Amen, Amen.